You're listening to the Life Purpose Advisor Podcast, episode 28. No matter where you are, what your responsibilities, I have a million responsibilities. I have a mil- I could make a million excuses why I don't have time and I need more sleep and all of these things. I think no matter your circumstances, you can start something if you really want to. You're listening to the Life Purpose Advisor Podcast. Life Purpose, spirituality, higher calling, personal growth, meaningful life. We ask the deep questions about living a balanced life of meaning, purpose, and joy. Passion. Know thyself. Be mindful. Spiritual practice. Aha moments. Life lessons. Balance. It is time to welcome your host, Angie Swartz. Brendan Hufford is a high school assistant principal with a deep interest in entrepreneurship. In addition to his full-time job, he manages two online businesses and is the host of the highly successful Entrepreneurs and Coffee podcast. Brendan believes that you can make radical change in your life and your business by taking action. Brendan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me on Life Purpose Advisor, Angie. I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited to talk about your story. I mean, you've got such an interesting mix of things. How does a high school principal turn into an entrepreneur? I think in looking back, it's always been a part of my story. I was taught a while ago that when I, you want to find your kind of your purpose to look back at things that have been a trend throughout your life. And being an entrepreneur is something that's always been a part of my life. I have very vivid memories of doing an activity in fourth grade where we had a kind of an economic village activity and I just dominated it. I built a business and made this money and market. It was, it was wild experience, but. And looking back, I can see it's kind of always been there. It's always been there. And what, what directed you to become a principal? So I think we're a mix of nature and nurture. And it's obviously in my nature to be very entrepreneurial, to start and grow businesses. But I was kind of nurtured away from it. I was in high school and everybody was like, well, you're good at school. You should be a teacher. So I went to college. And, I, you know, apparently we think at 18, kids are mature enough to choose their life path. So at 18, I decided I'll be a teacher, and I went to school for it, did everything right, got out of school, got a teaching job, did everything right, went to grad school, got my administrator's license, and now I'm an assistant principal. But a couple of years ago, I was really frustrated at work, and I started to focus more on my passion of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and there wasn't a really a website that kind of kept everything together for the Chicago Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community. So I made one and it had tournament dates and gym reviews and resources. And I think I found that you could put affiliate links on there and people would click on them and you made money. And it was really wild to get money from just having a website. I never knew that was possible. And I found Pat Flynn's Smart Passive Income website. And then I found Gary Vaynerchuk and I started reviewing jujitsu geese just on the side for fun because I didn't have to pay for them anymore. Companies would just send them to me. And then that grew. And again, we're kind of seeing this entrepreneurial pattern start again. I decided to start my own company called OK Kimonos. And I've been running that for a few years and I still have it. And it's going awesome. And then now the teaching side came out. I wanted to teach. I wanted to share. And I tried to tell all my friends about this and I tried to tell my family about it, and I think they're all sick of hearing about it. So I decided that since I loved podcasts, I'd start a podcast to teach people kind of what I've learned growing these side businesses to a really, you know, pretty nearly full-time level over the past couple of years. It's almost like we speak a different language sometimes from our friends that are not on entrepreneurs. Like we're excited about our wins and we're like, yeah, okay, okay, that's that's good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So it's it's good to have other other people in your tribe around you. And who can't listen to Gary Vaynerchuk and get excited about being an entrepreneur? Oh, man, I, when I found him, I went on this horrible, like, some people binge on Netflix and stuff. I went on this horrible, like, Gary Vaynerchuk binge. And this was before the Ask Gary V show. This was years ago. So the only thing online were his keynotes. And I guess Wine Library, but I didn't watch any of those. I just watched back to back, like 45 minute keynote after keynote mm-hmm. after keynote over and over and over again. And it was, yeah, I was up till like two or three in the morning, probably one night watching it. And I showed my right different language, showed my wife, and she's like, "Why is he screaming?" I'm like, <laughs> "Look, this is the best thing ever." So 
I got really into that. And, yeah, I think he's he's not only highly motivational, I just think he's one of the very few people who has a level of arrogance that I have and I'm attracted to and I like because he's so confident in himself and he's so often right that I really like that style and I like what he has to say. He's a pretty amazing guy. I remember the first time I met Gary, I believe it was in 2008, and he was speaking in a small room in Las Vegas, and I was sitting in the front, and I stayed and went up and talked to him afterwards, and he just has this energy that you know that you want what he has. Plus, he's a super nice guy. I don't know if you've ever met him, but he's he's an amazing giver. He really does walk the talk, and I personally think that He's got his finger on trends. Like, he really pays a lot of attention and is a pretty good predictor about where things are going. Yeah, and I just really love his idea of just give and give and give until your eyeballs pop out. And then people, it sounds bad because it sounds like you're being manipulative to say, you know, I'm going to give and give and give until you feel so bad that you buy my stuff. But really, I'm just going to put so much value into you, into your life. I'm going to help you so much that you just want to reciprocate. And I think that's the best way to live, like just giving to everybody else. Then they give back because they want to. You're all just doing what you want to do and helping each other. That's perfect. And I love that mm-hmm. mindset. And that's that mindset has really helped me grow my businesses. Well, I look forward to the day where I see you and Gary V standing on stage talking together. Guaranteed. Let's have a wager. Guaranteed Let's have a wager about how good, good. I look forward to seeing it. So can we talk about you a little bit personally? Yeah, I was just writing down the date so I didn't forget this is the day that we decided I was going to be on stage with Gary Vaynerchuk. 3-4-2015. Yep. Right. Maybe Gary's out there. He'll be out there listening and, and maybe he'll make it happen. For sure. So do you know what your purpose is? You alluded to it a little bit, but do you know what your life purpose is? So I'm really driven by the idea of servant leadership, obviously, with all the talk of giving and things like that. I'm a Christian, and I really believe in the model of Jesus and how he led people through teaching, through service, through ultimately sacrifice. And I don't know what path God has for me. I really don't. And I'm 100% okay with that. And I'm just going to keep trying to live a very purposeful life the way that God wants me to. And I'm just going to continue to go forward. But I really feel like my purpose, God is going to use me in some way to serve others. And I I think it's going to be pretty big. And I'm excited about that. But like I said, I don't I don't know what that's going to look like. I, I couldn't have told you five years ago that I would be here talking to you about this. And I'm excited that five years from now, you know, I might be on stage with Gary Vaynerchuk doing something big for people. So that would be cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And your faith, mm-hmm. uh, you talked that that's very, a very deep part of you. Has that always been the case since you were young or have, have things happened along the way to push you more in that direction? You know, I think when I was young, I didn't really understand what my faith was and who God is. And I guess the more I'm realizing, the more I'm on this walk with God, the more I realize that as I I think I'm walking towards the deeper end of the pool, like my relationship with God is getting deeper, my understanding is getting deeper, but I look back and I'm still standing in the shallow end. And I just keep going forward and I keep going. And the thing is, like, I'm just amazed at how deep my relationship with God is. And then also that I still feel like I've barely even scratched the surface with it, but it hasn't been that way over time. You know, I went to high school and I was really into youth group, but I was so immature and my relationship with God was very shallow and untested and it really had to be tempered by fire and trial and tribulation. And I went through a lot when I was in college and I did the typical American college thing. You know, my opinion on college is it's a great place to party and have fun. It's not necessarily the best option for education anymore with how expensive it is. But I went there and I got drunk a lot and I did a lot of drugs and didn't make the best choices and I barely got out. And I guess I just kind of fell into that pattern and it took a while. It took kind of a downward spiral of drinking and things like that. I didn't do any of the other stuff after school, but it got to the point where maybe, let's say, like, I guess I could look at my phone, like 280 something days ago when I stopped drinking completely. 
And I just decided it didn't have a place in my life. And, and a lot of that was because that wasn't the person that I felt that God wanted me to be. And I feel like I'm pursuing the business and being the father and being the husband and the man that I see modeled biblically. And that's really been a guiding force for me. But, yeah, it hasn't always been like that. So 280 days ago you stopped drinking. What what was the the uh, the the influence that got you to make that decision? <laughs> um, I wish I could say I just woke up and was like, I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> I don't think that happens to too many. Yeah, too many I don't people. really think that's the story when you stop drinking. But I did. I had fallen into a very bad pattern, and in retrospect, I had a very unhealthy relationship with alcohol for a long time. Um, of just a lot of frustration and not knowing how to deal with it and drinking to solve those frustrations at work, feeling trapped in my business, feeling ungrateful for what I had. You know, I had this beautiful, amazing son and this incredible wife, and I was so unhappy, and I was unhappy that I was unhappy. Like, shouldn't you be happy, you jerk? Like, you have all of this. And I just drank a little bit, and I kind of, if you picture it like a roller coaster, I just tipped over the top of the roller coaster. I had just enough that I made it okay for myself to have another drink, and I drank a lot, and then we went to bed, and it was fine, but in the middle of the night, my son woke up, and I was obviously getting more and more intoxicated as I was sleeping, and I got up, and I went to get him, and my wife knew that I was not right, and it, you know, it didn't end well. And it just came to the decision of, like, if I'm going to be, you know, luckily she let it be my decision, but it was just the decision of, like, if I'm going to continue to be my son's father and my wife's husband, like, I can't do this anymore. I can't Mm -hmm. drink like this, and I can't, you know. And and I married a woman. I've always been attracted to strong – I was raised by, and I've always been attracted to very strong women. And my wife, frankly, is not the type of woman that's going to put up with that long term. So Mm – you know, it just, I decided that that's not going to be in my life. And I've always been like this, right? I've always been like blast and dust. Um, I've always been on or off. And like when I don't, I've not missed alcohol at all. It doesn't bother me at all not to drink now. I just don't, it's just not in my life. It's just one of the, it's just kind of how I'm wired. What would you say to other people out there that are, are on and off people that are drinking and know that they have that kind of personality? Man. If you're drinking and you have this kind of personality, first of all, I understand that for you, that there's not a lot that I can tell you to do. It's got to be your decision. You're not going to hear Brendan on a podcast and decide. I pray for you that you don't have to hit rock bottom. Uh, luckily, I didn't have to hit total rock bottom. My wife didn't have to leave me. I didn't have to risk you know, any of that stuff. Could have gotten way worse. Nothing bad happened when I was drinking. But if you are, like, sit down and picture what rock bottom is for you and put yourself there and realize, you know, what would it be like to lose your kids and to lose your spouse and to lose everything you have here? And if you have a relationship with God, imagine losing that, you know, and if that doesn't give you the motivation to get yourself right, like see somebody, you know, we can only talk for a couple minutes here, but there's people that will help you with this that are incredibly helpful. And you might, you know, I realized in retrospect, I had a lot of issues at the time that I had no idea about, but it was all only through talking to really smart people that I helped to, you know, they helped me kind of understand what those issues were. So go out and Mm -hmm. don't be afraid to talk to somebody. There's a lot of cultures that are that look down on therapy and things like that. And I think that's really a shame because these are people who are trained to help you just by talking to you. And that's an incredible power to have. So you mentioned that you talked to really smart people. Mm-hmm. So you talked to therapists. Did you join AA? Um, I did not join AA. I decided when I stopped that if I couldn't, that I was going to. The person I talked to that made the biggest impact for me is my pastor. And that's not because he's, it's like woo woo, like, oh, he's your pastor. Like he's a spiritual sage. Like he's a man and his name is Lou Rodriguez and he is my friend, but he's also my pastor. Um, And he is the most transparent and honest and genuine human being I've ever met in my life. And 
he really helped me. You know, we sat and we talked about my relationship with my father and we talked about my relationship with my business and where I was going in my life. So a lot of the things I said at the beginning of our conversation about feeling trapped and all of that stuff, I learned just through conversation with him. It's all in there. It's all buried way deep in your subconscious, but it's in there. You just have to, you know, have somebody who's capable of asking the right questions and having the right kind of conversation to get it out. Yeah, I'm glad that you said what you said about uh, the stigma around therapy. And and the same thing goes with coaching. Like if you look at the most successful people in our culture, they, they surround themselves with people like that. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, for sure. And in, in fact, makes you grow to a bigger, better version of yourself. So that's what I would say if I only had one thing to say to people that are out there listening. The same as you is is go find your personal board of directors out there and, and get the, put those people to work for you. Yeah, your level of success is directly related to your level of personal development. You know, people, we put all this work into other things, into businesses and sports and athletic pursuits, and we'll work on our car for hours, but we don't work on ourselves, or we don't work on our marriage, or we don't work on our, like, you know, you'll read 10 books about business and not read one about how to have a great relationship with your kid. Like, what? <laughs> Where are your That's priorities? right, because we have to sit down and watch House of Cards, binge watch House of right. Cards on Netflix. We don't have time for that. The number one important thing. I want to just go back for a minute. You were talking about the night that you woke up to go get your son, and you said it didn't end well. I just wanted to clarify. I sure. assume you mean you had an argument and that your son is fine, nothing happened oh, to yeah. him. So I just ended up, my wife got was scared, and she called her parents, and she went over to her parents' house, and... I ended up driving like an idiot and going to get food with my buddy who is uh, my buddy Jason from he goes to my church too. I do have friends outside of my church family, but like they're really good in in my times of need. They've always been there for me and I've always been there for them. But my buddy Jason just kind of talked to me about everything that was going on and stuff and he was a great person to not sit in judgment, which I think is another big misnomer about Christianity. There's so much, it's represented so heavily in media as this judgmental thing when it's really the exact opposite biblically. And he just, it was cool to not be judged for what had just happened and the fact that I was an idiot. And then he took me home and I started kind of trying to pick up the pieces, but that's, it wasn't, yeah, nothing tragic happened. During, I'm very grateful to hear that during, during your time of, of massive drinking were you active in your church and with your faith at that time as well no 100 percent. i was completely i had completely compartmentalized it in my life Got it. like i would come home from work and i would drink a little bit and i would you know drink a little more and then i would kind of like on the low try and like drink a little more and it's like that you know when you're when you're sneaking drinks in your own freaking house that's that you know i don't that's so bizarre it's not bizarre it's tragic and it's it should definitely be a red flag for a lot of people like when you can't drink the amount you want to drink in front of somebody like that's because you know there's something there's there's an issue there and i think mm -hmm. it's way better to just address that and move forward so what's taken up your energy in this new 280 days that energy you were spending on alcohol before? Mm -hmm. What's what's taken up that space today? So I had been running my business and growing it, and I was really active, like you said, in church and at work, and I was really firing on all cylinders. But I've now been able to take a much more renewed focus on my health, which has been really fantastic. I've always been active with jujitsu and the weight training that goes along with it, you know, conditioning, everything. I've always been incredibly active, but now being able to focus on that side a little bit more. And then also I just feel so much sharper, so much more effective in every, it's kind of like my push goal. It just multiplies every other goal that I have just being sober and it's tremendously valuable. Nothing really with the time, I'm still, but the time is, you know, not more, but just such better quality in every area of my life. Do you think you've raised your consciousness? I would say, yeah. I think that I'm operating at a much higher level. I've always been incredibly introspective. Uh, it's just how I'm wired. I've always sat down and thought, why am I like this? Why am I doing this? Why are they doing that? What about, you know, my, it's the way my wife and I talk. We'll go on long car drives and 
break down each other's things about like, do you think you do this because your parents were like this when you were growing up or whatever? But I think I'm really operating at a much more, I know it seems weird, almost like kind of like a, not to be, again, it sounds really woo woo, but like almost like a meta kind of state where I, and I attribute this a lot to my morning routine, which now includes meditation, which I've been doing since I stopped drinking, but just meditating and things like that. I've now been a lot more, conscious of my emotions as they're happening and my decisions as they're happening. I'm not, I'm no longer just purely reacting in my life. You're present. Mm -hmm, Very much so. Present to your life. Since you brought up your morning ritual, Mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit more about your practice? What else do you do besides meditate? Sure. So it's changed a little bit over time, but it is, I've added a couple things even in the last week. I borrowed this from Pat Flynn. He said when he got gets up every day, the first thing he does is he washes his face and he brushes his teeth. And I usually just went and made coffee right away. But I started washing my face and brushing my teeth and whole, like just cold water on a washcloth, just wiping my face off and then brushing my teeth. I'm like wide awake after that. It's amazing. It's better than coffee. Um, but nobody wants to listen to the entrepreneurs and wash your face and brush your teeth podcast. So we'll stick with coffee. Um, so I still, I do that next face, teeth, coffee. I go out in the living room and I foam roll. I, you know what a foam roller is? Mm -hmm, I do. So I foam roll my glutes and my IT band and I have this little ball that I use in the bottom of my feet. I just wrote just from sitting so much and then the combination of going from sitting a long time to a human demolition derby like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, like hard grappling, you go from being completely immobile to being like hypermobile really fast and it's got a lot of wear and tear. So I found that foam rolling keeps me in a much more healthy state as far as my flexibility, my mobility goes. And then I have this thing called the five minute journal that I write in three things I'm grateful for, three things I want to accomplish today. It's a cool quote. And then I write in there. What's the last one? Uh, Kind of just like a, an affirmation for my day. After that, I might read for a little bit. I'm reading. What am I reading right now? I just, I'm not reading anything. I just finished reading Blake Mykoski, I think his last name is, the guy who started Tom's. It's called, it's a book called Start Something That Matters, which is fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and then I'll read the Bible for a little bit and I'll pray and I'll meditate and then I get to work. So it sounds like there's a lot of things in there, but I'm just kind of trying to cram a short amount of all the really important stuff at the beginning of my day and be very intentional about it. And I've found that those things very specifically have increased my productivity and just really increased the value I get out of my life. And how long does all that take you? Like 45 minutes. You know, I might only read for five minutes, but five minutes a day adds up, you know, over time. And I, Absolutely. You know, I might only pray for 30 seconds. I, I'm very intentional about my prayer. I don't think it has to be this weird, like, whatever comes to you type of thing, because there's too much pressure there. I have crap that's important to me, and I want to tell God that this crap is important to me. So I have a list of things that I pray for every single day. And it might seem robotic to some people, but to me, it is just me being intentional about, like, God, these are the things I really that you've given me that I really value. And this is how I want to live and how I want to serve you. So I just pray that happens. And it, yeah, it only takes about 45 minutes, but just not a, like how long does 30 push ups take? Not that mm-hmm. long. So it sounds mm-hmm. like a lot of things, but it's, in reality, it's pretty quick. Right. Well, I ask you that question for the benefit of everyone that's listening who thinks that they don't have time in their day. So, again, we're talking to a man who is a assistant principal, runs businesses, is a father, practices a martial art, and he still finds time in his day for daily practice, which you're a pretty busy guy, so I think that's a, a good example for, for anybody out there thinking, how am I going to fit this into my life? It's one of those weird things, though, Angie. Like, you'd think that it would take up time so that it would be you'd be less effective because you're now cutting 45 minutes out of your morning, but I would argue I am so much more effective in my whole life, including my business time, which is what's that what that is cut out of uh, in the mornings, and... I I don't think I could be where I am now without it. It's tremendously valuable. And it all kind of stemmed from reading this really cool book by Hal Elrod called The Miracle Morning, which was really valuable to me. The Miracle Morning. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend that? Highly. 
Yeah, it's very interesting about how we, when we take charge of our own time, we expand time and slow things down by speeding things up. Mm -hmm. It's almost counterintuitive as to how that works. Definitely. Let's talk just a little bit more about about God and your spiritual beliefs and, and what do you think that means? Like, tell me in very clear terms, like, who is God to you? So God to me is my Heavenly Father. He is my friend. He's my Savior. And he's somebody with whom I have a very deep, close, personal relationship with. I think that my rela- what I love about God is that he's not distant. He's not like I don't have to read about him at bo- him in books. I don't have to listen to a priest tell me about him. He's I can experience God very immediately, very intimately right now, right here. And yeah, I guess that's who God is to me. And how? How do you do that? Experience God and the intimate connection right now. So I think everybody, I think God kind of speaks to everybody differently. Uh, I don't feel that we all, you know, biblically speaking, I don't think we all have a connection with God where it's like he's there in front of you. I One of the best ways I can explain it is because God is, God, it sounds so <laughs> I keep saying woo-woo, right? I clearly don't talk about this stuff enough. But I think, and I feel very strongly that God is so holy and so uh, infinite's not the best word, but it's the best word I have right now, that if even one tiny, like, iota of God was in front of me, there I could no longer doubt. You know, believing in him and worshiping him would no longer be a choice because I would see this awesome power displayed right in front of me. And I think if God revealed himself to all of us in that sort of way, we would no longer have a choice, which unfortunately would make us no better than animals. One of the big things is that we need to choose to have a relationship with God. That's what he wants for us. You know, he's not here to dominate us and force us to do anything. Like we were given free will so that we could have a choice to be in a close personal relationship with him. If you look at, biblically speaking, like in the garden, Adam and Eve had a really super close personal relationship, one-on-one, face-to-face relationship with God. And I think that's where we're headed. And I think that's where I'll be someday. But I think here and now that I just can't have that. And I like that I'm given the choice. I like that I choose to do this. Um, And I think it's awesome because from the beginning, you know, from the first second we're born to the last second we die, no matter what we do in our lives, we can always make that choice. Mm -hmm. So do you think God is in the likeness of you and presides over the entire world? I think that I'm made in his image. I think that we as human beings share many characteristics of God. But I definitely don't believe that we, I mean, we are a a distant reflection of him or translation of him. We're not, we do not embody a lot of the things that God is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I do think we're, you know, we were created in his image. So there are a lot of things we have in common with him. Right. What about heaven and hell? Do you believe that that exists? Absolutely. I don't think you can believe one thing. I think anybody who believes one thing in the Bible and doesn't believe in other things, it's really difficult because you can't say like, in, you know, Jesus said this, but he also said this. And now I believe that, but I don't believe that. Like I can't believe in Jesus. I can't believe in God and not believe in hell and not believe in Satan and Lucifer. Like they, he's just as real as they are. You know, I can't believe in one part and not the other. I see. Thank you for that. Of course. Anything else you'd like to say about that, your relationship with God or definition of God? I don't know. Like, I feel that it's really personal. And I'm not a very big evangelist with trying to tell. I just hope that people would kind of look at me and say, like, oh, well, if he's into that, then that and I'm interested in him. It might be something worth checking out. I think God will work in that space. But one of the things that frustrates me a lot, I kind of alluded to this a second ago is just the rap 
that Christianity gets because of how it's portrayed. And I think there's a lot of people for their best intentions really have Christianity wrong. You know, when you hear about Christian churches protesting military funerals and judging people and, you know, hurting people and turning people away because of X, Y, and Z, because of rules that are not even based in the Bible, that's very frustrating to me. And I, I think what Christianity is and what Jesus called, there's a really amazing pastor uh, named David Platt, who I, I like a lot. And he's very big on looking at what Jesus actually says in the Bible versus like the Christian tradition and the Christian rules and whatever, like the religion of Christianity. Um, and I think if you really look at the words of Jesus in the Bible, uh, the message portrayed is we've strayed a little bit from that. So I think it's worth no matter what your faith is or you don't have a faith or you could care less. Like, I think Jesus is somebody worth studying from a business perspective, but also from a life perspective. And I think if you look at what he actually says there, there's a lot of really cool stuff that will bring a lot of value into your life. That's very true and very true about many, many spiritual leaders that we look across the world. We could say, you know, similar things about studying Gandhi, studying Mother Teresa, you know, studying the Taoist beliefs. If you dive deep into all those things, it really seems like it all comes from the same place. I mean, I don't, I personally don't believe it all comes from the same place. I think that, again, you can't pick, like, I can't say that Christianity is this, but it could also be Buddhism, but it could also be parts of Hinduism. Like, it's all central, and we've all just got different versions of it. Like, Christianity, for better or worse, is it's either right or it's wrong. Because when Jesus says, like, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and nobody gets through my father except through me, like, that's it. Like, you you either believe that that is how you're getting to heaven or it's not. So you can't, I, th I think with Christianity, you can't be like, if you really look at it, you can't really be like Christian light, you know, like diet Christianity. You're either in or you're out. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think it kind of separates itself from a little bit from a lot of other things. We could spend hours talking about this topic, sure. and I very much appreciate your transparency and your own beliefs and and uh, being willing to share that with anyone that's listening today. I'm going to redirect us a little bit back to your physical practice. You talk about jujitsu, uh -huh. Brazilian jujitsu. Jiu why do you spend? Why do you think it's important to spend time on the phys physical body? And do you think it uh, has an impact on our purpose and what we do every day, or is it just a sport for you? So I think a big, the biggest thing that gets, and maybe you would agree with this, Angie. The, one of the biggest things that gets in our way as human beings is our ego, and I have found that nothing tempers your ego better than physical training, specifically something like grappling, where somebody else is physically trying to make you quit and break your will to continue. Um, anybody who grew up wrestling in high school or college knows exactly what I'm talking about, and definitely anybody who's done jujitsu knows what I'm talking about. When you get pushed to that breaking point, and these are your friends, these are people who care about you. Um, when you're pushed to that mental breaking point on a daily or bi daily or weekly basis, most people don't ever get that in their life. Like they're not pushed to the breaking point. So when something bad happens in their life, and that's the first time they've ever felt like breaking, they fall apart. But I don't know tools. Yeah. Right. And no, uh, no calluses over that mm -hmm. like muscle of their being, you know. There's nothing built up. And when I feel like I'm going to break, like I bounce back so hard. Um, it's almost like a rubber band. Like I come back harder. And I do great in adversity. I don't have a lot of quit in me. It's very hard to make me quit in jujitsu and in life. So I think that that physical training and caring a lot about that type of stuff really helps us with our ego. And then I think any, if you look at successful entrepreneurs, especially people that I like, like Pat Flynn and Gary Vaynerchuk, having a renewed sense in their health. Um, and I don't mean like, oh, I'm drinking juice now. I'm healthy. No, I mean like really taking an overall holistic, comprehensive look at your sleep, your diet, and nutrition, your physical exercise, like all of that stuff will make a huge difference in your relationships and your business in areas you don't think it would, but it does because we're holistic creatures. Everything is a piece of the puzzle. 
Mm-hmm. And and you're astute. We do see that going on with many of the folks that that are uh, digital marketers. We see Chris Brogan out there really pumping yeah. some iron in the best shape of his life. Our mutual friend John Lee Dumas. Uh, I know when I first met, or the second time I think when I met John and Nick Unsworth, they were on a, a physical challenge together. So it's it's definitely in the forefront of what's on people's minds today. For sure. So, so if you're, if you're doing, ju- do you, how often do you practice jujitsu? Uh, as much as I can. It'll be anywhere from, like, there might be a week where I don't train at all, and then a week where I train three times. But and is there a, a noticeable difference between how you feel in those two weeks? So the training, here's my thoughts on training. I do a lot of strength and conditioning work every single morning that I can. Uh, so that's going to a gym and doing sprints, and I have a whole program that I do. So I do that as often as I can, so I tend to try and stay in pretty good shape. I still eat whatever I want, but I stay in fairly decent shape. I feel way better when I'm not doing jujitsu. And that is simply because I go so hard and I train so hard that I tend to wreck myself. And then the training is not the the benefit. The benefit is the recovery afterwards. So when I'm tra- mm. if I have a really hard week of training, I feel like crap. But the next week and the week after and the week after when my body is super compensating to recover from that, I feel fantastic. And that kind of, you know, what the cool thing is because I'm not – a competitive athlete, we don't have seasons in jujitsu, I can recover and I can have a recover, you know, an off season whenever I want to, and I can take a break and I can only go once a week or what, or not at all. So I feel a lot better when I'm not doing it, but it's only because I'm doing it. I understand. Since you mentioned that you're still eating whatever you want to, can I ask how old you are? <laughs> no, I'm 30. So I eat whatever. I Don't worry. It shows. It was literally like my son was born and my body was like, mm, yeah, we're not going to work a little different now. You know, I, <laughs> that donut that you used to be able to eat like seven of, don't look at it because you're going to get fat. So I, I, right. I, I can eat if I want to actually be like physically lean. I can have like the smell portion of the junk food that I like to eat. I have to keep a really, really tight kind of ketogenic, low-carb diet to get really, really lean, and which is very valuable in grappling because it puts you in a lower weight class. But Mm -hmm. right now, I'm so focused on just the quality of my life and enjoying the eating and the training. I just want to enjoy it all. I feel so blessed that to have all of these things, that to suffer in an area that I don't have to, I'd rather put all of that focus into my business right now. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How old's your son? He's one and a half. And he's your only only guy so far? He's our only guy so far. Um, we're definitely going to have more, but he is our monster right now. <laughs> Just wait. I can't. <laughs> the next year are, are even more, mm-hmm. are, are even more, even more monster will show up, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. He's become, I came in the kitchen the other day and I immediately took a video on my phone of him. We have those, pay, those, uh, trash bags that are in rolls and I look mm-hmm. over and I just hear shh, shh, shh. <laughs> and I look over and he's just pulling them out one at a time and there's like 60 of them around him and I look at my wife I go are you you got anything to say about this and she goes about what never mind never mind <laughs> it's fine so he's he's a trip I love him it's so cool to see him learn things that I didn't teach him that's both horrifying and amazing so it's a lot of fun Right. And it, and it, like like you were saying about your relationship with God, like you think that you're moving towards the deep end, it's the same thing with parenting. Mm-hmm. Like you think you've kind of got it and then there's a there's a whole nother level of learning and also connection and intimacy and relationship that you weren't expecting. So, it's a true gift in life. I agree with you 110%. So, can I ask you a lightning round round of yes or no and short answer questions? Yeah. Do you think passion and purpose are the same things? No. Do you think everyone has a life purpose? Yes. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being high, how important is following your own joy in igniting your life purpose? An 11. Did you ever quit your job to follow your purpose, and do you think somebody needs to? I haven't yet, and no, I don't think somebody needs to necessarily quit their job to follow their life purpose. 
I think good. Can I? Uh, I want short, yes, short answer, right? Yes. I think being an entrepreneur is very romanticized right now, and I think my best aspect as an entrepreneur is that I'm really good at taking punches. I'm very durable. It's my skill in jujitsu. I don't quit, uh, but it's also my skill as an entrepreneur. And this crap is hard. It's way harder than just going to work and getting a paycheck. I don't Isn't think, that the truth? Yeah. I don't think everybody should be an entrepreneur. I do believe everybody should have a side business. I think it provides a lot more leverage and freedom should something happen to your job. But you're not in control of your job, and you're really not in control when you're, in an, when you're an entrepreneur. And I think being an entrepreneur is way harder, and I don't think everybody's wired for it the way that maybe I and other people are. Mm-hmm. I would certainly agree with everything you said about that. And I'm glad that you said it's hard. Mm-hmm. It's 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 a love, but it's a painful one at times, for sure. Definitely. But like you just asked me, like if I didn't, that that is my joy. And if I didn't do that in life, like, I mean, I've seen, I've been there, you know, with the drinking and the unhappiness. And I don't know if I was depressed because I wasn't diagnosed. And I don't want to take that away from people who really do suffer from clinical depression. But I was, it was a very, very difficult time. And now that my life is a lot more congruent and aligned with that, I'm, a, I'm much happier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What brings you the greatest joy in your life? My son's laughter. Mm, That's nice. Mm -hmm. If you unexpectedly amassed a good-sized fortune, what would you do differently? I would definitely quit quit working at a school, and I would probably find the best way to give it away. I have all the skills that I need to take care of my family and live a comfortable life. I think... The, if I had a good sized fortune, the best thing to do would be to use it responsibly. Uh, you know, I'm a steward of it. So, right, very nice. Mm-hmm. Tell me, what should listeners learn from your life? I think listeners should learn from my life that it's never too late to start something. I'm sure some of your listeners think that like I'm really young, but I think I, just being 30. I don't know. Some of your listeners might think I'm super old. I'm not sure, but it's never too late. Like you can, whether you're 18, start something. If you are 40 or you're 70, like you can still start something. We live in this beautiful day and age. And no matter where you are, what your responsibilities, I have a million responsibilities. I have a mil- I could make a million excuses why I don't have time and I need more sleep and all of these things. I think no matter your circumstances, you, you can start something if you really want to. Mm, I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. So speaking of sleep, how much sleep do you get every night? I track, and I, I have a really cool app. It used to be called Lyft. Now it's called Coach Me. It's just the website coach.me. Uh, it's really cool, and it helps me build habits, but it also helps me look like if I'm feeling really broken down for a while, I can look back and see what I've maybe been messing up on. Uh, but I track my sleep. I try and get seven hours a night, and I'm able to do that most nights. I might go for a stretch where I don't just because I'm really trying to grind some workout, but I get up at three in the morning every single morning. So if I can be in bed by eight, that means I can be up at three and usually my son goes to bed around then. So it's not that hard to do. Mm -hmm. And why do you get up at three o'clock? Because no, it's, that's like my number one tip. If you are, if you have kids and they're little uh, and they're still sleeping, or if you have older kids and they're still sleeping, like get up earlier than everybody else. There's nobody online to talk to. There's nothing to go do. There's less distractions. I just get up earlier and I just grind and I get work done. It's It's been probably the most, I've tried doing it at the end of the day and you're so burned out, but I start the day with that awesome routine and then I get right to work or I go work out and then I come home and do work. It's been really, really valuable. How long have you been doing that? Um, probably, probably for the last year I've been getting up this way. It grew kind of slowly. It was like, well, I'm going to get up at five. And then I was getting up, I was getting excited about projects. So I got up at four and then I'm like, I wonder if I can sustain three. I tried two, honestly, you know, as we're talking right now, about two weeks ago, I tried to get up at two a couple days in a row and I immediately got sick. And I was like, all right, that's my body. I'm like a race car. Like, I don't slow down gradually. I don't just wear down. I just crash into the wall at 350 miles an hour or whatever they do. So mm-hmm. I just immediately got super sick. And I was like, all right, 2 o'clock's too early. Let me recover, <laughs> and we'll go back to 3. 
<laughs> which is so pretty, pretty darn early in the morning. Oh, it's the best. I wouldn't. Oh, it's so great. I know everybody. And that's another thing, right? You can do it. If you really, here's the thing. I go to bed every night. I'm not making this up. I go to bed every night so freaking happy because the next thing that's going to happen is I get to wake up and I get to do my morning routine and I get to do work. And when you are doing work, I know people say this and it might not make sense unless you're in it. When you're doing work you're passionate about and you're doing crap you love and it has the potential to earn you a living, you'll get up at any time during the day to do that. Like there's nothing that'll stop you. It's just figuring out what that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very inspiring. Mm -hmm. I do think I'm going to see you on stage with Gary V, and I look forward to that day. I um, will have to figure out what our wager is, but maybe you don't want to bet against yourself when you because you want to be up there with him. Sure. Let's. What can we do an over under? What do you think the over under is for that? Like how many mm. years? Let's see. I give you six, six to seven years. All right. I'll go. I'll make it even. I'll go five. So 2020. So if I go if I go over five, you win. If I can do it in under five, I'll win. Sounds like a great wager, and we have it re recorded here for for all posterity. So we'll see what happens. Cool. And uh, are you connected with Gary? Yeah, he's going to be on my podcast here in a couple weeks. Wonderful. So before we close today, thank you for being so authentic and telling your wonderful story today. Is there is there anything else that you want to mention? Do you want to talk a little bit about your podcast and what's going on there? What What's the purpose of Entrepreneurs and Coffee? Yeah, so the whole point of the podcast is really, like I've been kind of talking about, uh, growing my jiu-jitsu company on the side while I'm still working and still trying to be the best husband and dad that I can be. I've learned a lot, and I think it's I'm in a situation that a lot of guys and especially dads are in, and the podcast is just such an immediate, you know, we've you've been listening to us talk for 30, 45 minutes right now, and I would never go read a blog post for 45 minutes ever. Wouldn't that <laughs> be wouldn't that be not. the freaking worst? But <laughs> listening to us talk, like you can do this, and it's so immediate, it's so intimate. And I wanted that. I wanted to be able to share everything that I learned, and I didn't want to write it out. Obviously, I do a lot better when I'm just speaking. So Entrepreneurs and Coffee is really just a chance for you to sit down and have a cup of coffee with me or me and a guest and talk shop about taking action in our business and getting some real actionable advice on things you can do. And then also I want to mention I wanted to give something to everybody who's listening. If you have a business or you're thinking of starting one, I have some resources and some exercises that I think will be incredibly valuable to kind of get started, especially if you're bootstrapping like I did at first. You don't have any money. And people can find that at Brendan Hufford, which is just my name, brendanhufford.com slash life. Wonderful. And what, what will they find there? So what I have is I have 10 free tools that you can use to, like I said, bootstrap your business that were really, really valuable I'm surprised as I continue mentioning them in Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups and anywhere that I talk to people that they don't know about all of these because they're all free and they're all out there and they all have tons of users, but you'll find at least one or two in there that you've never used before. And then also a really cool thing that I learned from Jarek Robbins, who's Tony Robbins' son, called emotional stacking. And I've never found an exercise that allow that gets me to take action faster than the emotional stacking exercise and they can get that there again. It's just brendanhufford.com slash life. And I hope it helps. Terrific. Terrific. So all of you out there, we hope that you will listen to entrepreneurs and coffee and reach out and let Brendan know how you like what he's doing over there. Cool. And Angie, thanks again so much for having me on, especially a chance to talk about, I get asked the same questions over and over again and I love to help. So it's not a problem, but it's cool to be able to talk about things a little differently and from a different angle. So I'm really, really grateful for the chance to talk today. And as am I, I'm so glad that you made the time in your very busy life to come on the Life Purpose Advisor podcast and that you didn't make me get up at two o'clock in the morning. So I'm grateful for that or three. So. <laughs> You're welcome. So you've been listening to the Life Purpose Advisor podcast with Brendan Hufford of Entrepreneurs and Coffee today. We thank you for joining us. If you have questions about finding your life purpose, please come see me at www.lifepurposeadvisor.com where you can also find our show notes. We'd also like to hear from you if you're listening from another country. So please send us a message.
We'll see you next time.